Wow. Um, that, that was interesting. You know, I heard that. I know how you all hear you're all tight, and I thought to myself, you know, I know not all of us are Jewish here, so there's a picture here. Come on, somebody. What a mess. Sometimes we, <laughs> sometimes we need to kind of get a little comic relief from from these things. So I don't, I don't mean to make light of it, but I, I do mean to make light of it. Light of it. Um, we, we need it. We need it desperately. It's like everywhere you turn, there's like emergencies, prayer emergencies, and we want to make light of all of these emergencies. Bring all these emergencies to the light. Thank you, Father. Um, I'm just really blessed um, to have Michael with us here. Michael's sitting in the back. If you could please stand. Um, Michael is a support branch. He's like an, an elder at Congregation Mishkan Yeshua Haiti. And uh, it's just such a blessing to have him here. Usually when I see him, we are sweating and hot. <laughs> Today I picked him up. We have our, our coats. And... Um, I, I really wanted you to, the, Michael, could, could you please come up? Um, I don't know if you are, please come up. I don't know if you're aware of what's happening in Haiti. There's just, it's just a lot, of, a lot of trouble in Haiti. Well, there's usually trouble in Haiti, but this is specific. This is, this is like a, a shift, a possible shift of, of an overthrow of government type of problem. And, and it's, and they're actually hoping to install the grandson of a former dictator, uh, which would kind of be like going back into the darkness. Yeah. So, so, um, so our congregation hasn't been able to have services. People can't go to school. They can't go to work. They can't go shopping. It's been like kind of shut down. And so um, I'm going to ask you to extend your hands towards Michael as he stands here on behalf of the nation of Haiti. And Father God, as, as we lift up all these situations, Father God, that, that we need your help, Father, we thank you that there, there, isn't, there isn't that many things that you cannot handle at the same time. In the same way that you can help a boy to come out of prison, Father, you can extend your blessing to a nation, Father, who blessed your people and has been suffering for so long, Father. We ask, Father God, that you'll dispatch your angels, Father God, through the street. We ask for an angelic manifestation on the street, an angelic demonstration, Father God, to bring peace, Father, to that land, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you. And cancel, Father, the works of the enemy and the plans of the enemy, God. In all these situations, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. This is for your nation. Your nation. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. You're welcome. You're welcome here. Blessed to have you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Do you want to say anything to the people? Shabbat shalom to all. Shabbat shalom. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, before I had one thing, I, before I said, I'm pretty sure that I will have a wonderful Shabbat service with you. And at this present moment, is that I'm enjoying, okay? That means my thinking before was right. Okay, <laughs> uh, that means I have a very wonderful time with you. It's really, really amazing and a great Shabbat service. Shabbat Shalom again. Shabbat Shalom. Hallelujah. It, it kind of feel, feels surreal to see Michael, because you know, like it's like I see him in another galaxy, another universe. It seems that way, and um, we we do have a little praise report. Um, 
And I encourage you to remember praise reports because oftentimes we, we ask for uh, prayer for, for an emergency yeah. and, and people pray and it's very encouraging to hear a praise report. So remember to, to um, oh, like the lepers, remember the story of the lepers, there was I think 10 of them who got yeah. healed but only what, one or two came back and, and you know, remember the praise reports. They're so encouraging for those who, who pray. Otherwise, we feel like we're praying endlessly for nothing sometimes. It just feels like I just got to pray for something else and something else. You kind of become numb. To it. At least I did, anyway. <laughs> I know you're all holy. You never become numb like that. But I'm speaking for myself. So we do have a uh, praise report. Um, we got a message from the congregation in Haiti that the streets are, are calm enough for them to be able to have a service today. So that's it. Bless the Lord. Very good. Okay, so um, as, as you may know, sometimes we, we have certain routines and we may kind of plan, oh, you know, on Shabbat I'm going to come and I'm going to, you know, come to the service. And I just want to let you know that, that what we think is our routine or we think we planned, believe me, you did not plan it long before the foundation of the world. Your father knew exactly the moment in time that you had to be at where you have to be to, to, to hear, to experience, to speak, to share, to participate in his work. And his work is perfect. You know, it says in the scripture that he will not allow the word to retor, return back to him void. Uh, uh, meaning, he will not allow his word to return back to him until it has accomplished exactly what he sent it to do. And the last time I checked, he sent his word. And the word became flesh. And I realize that at this moment, we're all in different places, and some of us are experiencing good times, some of us are experiencing difficult times, and it kind of seems like, like, like the promises, like we're waiting for the promises to come through, we're waiting for God to move, we're waiting for something to happen, we're waiting for something to happen. And I, I just want to encourage you this morning, is sometimes we're waiting for an event that's actually waiting for us. And so today, this morning, I believe your Father wants to speak to you in a very personal way to help you understand that there is, there is, there is a backstory going on that you're unaware of when you're looking for something to take place in front of you. It, 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 like we read this week's Torah portion, and, and our focus, I understand, understandably, it's, it's Jacob, and, and Jacob wrestles with God, and then Jacob end up, ends up reuniting with his brother, and we, we see that, and, and we kind of get excited about it, but, but our situation is still the same. Like our bill problems are still the same. Our health is still the same. Like you can look at that story and say, that's amazing, that's great, great, but I'm not Jacob, I'm not there, I didn't have this encounter with God, I'm not, I still have family that don't speak to me, I, I, I wish I could make peace and I can't. And, and so you're looking at the story and, and, and you're kind of relating in a very small way, it's encouraging, but you look back in the mirror and you realize, but that's not me, that's another story. For somebody else. I'm still suffering. I'm still in this difficult situation. And if you want to be honest with yourself, that really is the truth. Because you know, you know, it's it's great to come and hallelujah, praise the Lord. He put food on my table. It's amazing. We're playing this one song, you know, God is good, you know. And you begin to look around and you begin to see some people who are sitting down, not moving at all, during most of the other songs. And suddenly that song comes up and the person who kind of looked down gets up and starts dancing around. And says, what is going on? Let me tell you what's going on. What's happening is that that song relates to the person who knows what it's like to have no food on their table. Relates to the person who knows what it's like to have no shoes on your feet. 
no money in your pocket. You know what it feels like. And so now when you see the song, you remember those little moments where someone gave you something so small. And that was the greatest gift they could have given you. So now you dance. Now you dance because you can relate to that. That's the back story. That's the story that's happening behind you that you're unaware of. This is why we can't judge anybody. I mean, it's so bad. Sometimes we see someone and they just rub us the wrong way. You have absolutely no idea what their backstory is. You have no idea where they've been. You have no idea what they've suffered. You have no idea what they're going through at this very moment. And they don't say hello to you or they, they don't treat you the way you think they should. And you're like, you know, I'm done with this person. I'm not going to say hello to them anymore. You have no idea that that person may be having a Gethsemane experience at that time. And they feel disconnected. They don't know how to put a smile on their face. They don't know how to come up and hug you. They don't know how to react in, in, in a loving, positive way. And they don't need you to judge that situation. They just need you to just lift them up. And bless them and encourage them. There's a back story that we're unaware of. And this morning, your father wants you to understand that in that back story, he's doing some of the greatest miracles. It is in that very back story that he is transforming things. You know, it's interesting. I, I, uh, I don't know why, but I, 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 I've enjoyed watching a lot of, you know, um, fighting. You know, I know it must be a guy thing or this guy <laughs> thing. I don't know. I'm always thinking about, you know, the, the story of Jacob and God wrestling, and I'm thinking it was like an MMA fight. <laughs> you know? Imagine the stats at the beginning. Yeah. You know, Jacob... You know, what about 40 years old? So much weight. On the other side, other night, ancient of days. <laughs> Nobody can measure his weight. I think it's so rigged. <laughs> what a mess. But something is going on there. And it's amazing because, you know, as, as I've, I've just, I, I don't know what it is. I'm just I'm kind of fascinated by, by this. And, and I don't really fully understand it. But I was listening to a jujutsu master, Brazilian jujutsu. They seem to be the ones who really kind of get the job done oh, yeah. on that octagon. And one of the things he was saying is that the human body is designed to deal with adversity in front of itself. But it is not designed to deal with that adversity that comes from behind. And so in jujitsu, they do very, 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 they spend a lot of time preparing the battle to get behind you and not to be f confronting you face to face like a boxer would, you know, in boxing, it's a face to face sport, okay? In jujitsu, what they want to do is set you up in a way to get behind you. Once they get behind you, then you'll get, end up getting choked out and, you, and, and you're done. You can't breathe, you can't fight. <laughs> You understand? So as I'm, because see, as I'm sitting down watching these crazy things, you know, I'm always talking to Adonai because he's sitting down next to me, you know, I go where he is, he is where I go. So all the crazy nonsense I watch, he's got to put up with it and sit next to me and says, what are we watching now? But I'm asking him questions. I'm asking him questions because I'm watching these crazy things. And so when this Jujutsu master was explaining about this whole thing in the back, I had a nice to pay close attention to that because most of us prepare ourselves for a confrontation and a battle, you know. And I don't mean like a fighting battle. I mean, in life, we, we prepare ourselves face to face. And I had a nice saying, you have no idea. I'm doing all the work behind you. <laughs> Where you have no protection. That's right. I'm, there is a back story. There is a back story to situations around your life that you have no idea. And the day's coming when you're going to realize this is, oh my God, it would have been impossible for me to have achieved what I achieved if there was not a back story behind me taking place. So this morning, I want you to understand most of us walk in this life broken for one main reason, which is rejection. Not being accepted. We got messed up with this since the moment that we were born. We were children. We were young. And we came out. And we came out pretty innocent. We came out into this world. And before long, every single one of you here experienced rejection. 
And it so burns into your soul that for the rest of your life, you spend all your time, all your effort trying to heal this hole in your soul and trying to plug it in with people who will accept you. And it's bizarre because no matter how many people accept you, you still feel the pain of rejection. And you still feel afraid that even though people may be filling in that void, they might turn away from you. Most of us suffer with this. I remember being a, a, a young boy, I, it may have been like third grade, it was a long time, I was in Angola, Africa, and I'll never forget this, I remember, you, you, you know like at schools, usually there's like a teacher, and they have like a teacher's pet, I don't know what it is, like the teacher has this, this thing for this one child. And you can see it. You can see the way they, they greet them when they come in in the morning. You can just see that the teacher really likes them. And I'll never forget, there's this one little boy. He was sitting up front, and he was tired, and he laid his little head to rest on the desk, right? And I'll never forget this. The teacher looked at everybody and said, shh, keep it down. <laughs> Look at him. He's so cute. He's resting. And I remember looking at this and oh my goodness, that must be the most awesome thing to have a teacher tell the whole class to be quiet because you're taking a little nap. So the next day, I could use some loving. And I was there sitting down. Now mind you, I was not tired. I did not need a nap. But I needed some love. So I put my beautiful little head on my little arms like Dabby. It was Dabby. <laughs> and I was just, I remember just laying there. I was not tired. I was not sleepy. But I was laying on my desk just waiting, waiting to feel that warm, loving experience of what it's like to have an entire class have to be silent for your sake. And I'll never forget it. There was like a very loud bang. Oh, that, that's, I should have hit something else. <laughs> that thing holds the door. Okay. Like, boom, really loud, and it startled me. But I made believe I wasn't startled and I just kept my head down. The loud thing was like a ruler on my desk. Boom! And I just made believe I didn't hear it. And the next words, I'll never forget. Class, look at this. Take a good look at this. And I'm still got my head down. I'm like... <laughs> I'm trying to make believe I'm sleeping so hard. She says, this is a vagabond. <laughs> that was the first time I heard the word vagabond, which in Portuguese is vagabundo. <laughs> Isto é um vagabundo. <laughs> now, I really didn't know what a vagabond was, but the vibes didn't feel very good. So I knew it wasn't good. It took me actually years to learn and figure out what a vagabond is. And I thought to myself after many years, I don't understand what made me any different than another child who was sleeping and me sleeping. Why am I a vagabond and the other person, everyone has to be silent. What is it? What it is, is welcome to planet Earth. We are in a place where God himself will find himself rejected. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I hate to say it this way, but if you find yourself in a place where you're being rejected and experiencing rejection, it means you're closer to the family of God than you realize. It is when everyone is accepting you that you should say, okay, what's going on? What's the catch? 
Now, I don't say this to be cynical. I say this because there's something in the backstory of this week's Torah portion that, that God wants you to understand. Something needs to be taking place in that place of suffering, that place of rejection, that place that all of us run away from. Something needs to happen there. It's the backstory that changes the catalyst for what happens to this man called Jacob. You see, Jacob, as you know very well, he had taken his older brother's inheritance. He had taken it, the blessing. He ran off with it. Nobody could undo what had happened. But amazingly, as soon as he gets into this new place where he's going to be, you know, making a, a living and taking care of things, he looks around and he sees that there is these two girls. One of them is Rachel. The other one is Leah. And he doesn't even pay any attention to Leah. He pays attention to Rachel because it says that Rachel had a shapely figure. I like the way the scriptures are explaining these things. Now, shapely figure. You'll have to use our imagination. I'm not going to go into describing what it is. But there was something about this girl that he was like, what's her name? I need, I, I, I need that. There, there's my rib right there. <laughs> All right? Now you have to understand that this guy was so intoxicated with his passion for this girl that he agreed to work for seven years. He agreed to work for seven years with no pay and the only thing he would get out of it is he gets to marry this girl, Rachel. That's it. Good deal for a Laban. So he works for seven years. He works and works and works. And in seven years, never once does he even greet or say hello to Leah. Because Leah was not a shapely figured person. It says that she had weak eyes. I don't even know what that means. It says that Leah had weak eyes. You know, Rachel was shapely. Leia had weak eyes. I don't know if she was cross-eyed. I don't know what the problem was. I don't know what it is. It doesn't say just said that her eyes were weak. It's amazing. One has a shapely figure. The other one has weak eyes. I mean, why couldn't she have a shapely figure with weak eyes? I don't know what the problem is. But that's how it's described. But Jacob never paid attention to this other one. You see, this is amazing. You see, you leave your father's house and you have the older brother's blessing and you don't realize that when you get the older brother's blessing, there is a responsibility that comes with it, which means you're supposed to take the older daughter, not the younger. You see, you want to leave with the blessing but walk around like you're still the younger brother. Oftentimes in our lives, we want God to bless us. We don't realize that there is a responsibility to the blessing. If you're going to get the older brother's blessing, then you have to walk in the shoes of the older brother, which means you have to take the older daughter. <laughs> That's the next thing in line. But you can't see that because you want to live like the younger kid. <laughs> we, yeah, we guys. <laughs> Ain't messing with that. But I imagine this backstory, working on a backstory here this morning. Imagine this. Seven years, working his behind, and he says, I love this girl so much that seven years seems just like a few days. <clears throat> Doesn't even matter to me. Laban says, wonderful, you've accomplished your job. So tonight is the wedding night. Enjoy yourself. You did it. Congratulations. Glory! Bring out the nations. <laughs> they were partying, celebrating, enjoying themselves. He worked for, so oh my goodness, seven years waiting for this. He is waiting for this moment. He cannot wait. He cannot wait. He cannot wait to go into the marriage chamber. <coughs> seven years he's waited for this. See, that wasn't like today's day and age. You know, you might wait seven minutes to get into the wedding chamber in today's day and age. Back then, seven years was seven years he had to go without. <laughs> I like that. You 
one of the sisters for a long time. <laughs> yeah, it's a long time. So he's partying, he's like, yes! He goes into the chamber, he gets himself ready, gets himself perfumed, gets his beard nice and combed, his little chest hair, Julio glasses, and he's like, oh. <laughs> He's ready. He is ready, he's just chilling out. He's got his gold chain with, you know, Mary on it. <laughs> maybe not, but maybe, who knows. He, whatever he's doing, he's doing to impress his girl that he has waited for. And here comes the wife in a burqa. Now they're not Muslim. But they did cover themselves because it was kind of like part of the thing. Now, I don't know what happened because usually in the burqa, you can see them eyes. That's all you can see. And somehow, he looked at her, he didn't realize these were the weak eyes looking back at him. Maybe he had so much to drink, he didn't realize that he was looking at weak eyes. So he just closed his eyes and says, oh, glory. And they had a wonderful evening together. In the morning when the sun came up before that girl put that burka hat on, I'm just, I'm goofing around. It wasn't a, I don't know what it was, something to cover her face. Before she put that thing on, he looked at her and he looked at her and he looked at her again and he just jumped out of the bed. <laughs> oh, hell no. <laughs> Now, I, I know some of us are a little too holy and we struggle with words, but let me tell you something. When you are in a, there are situations where you need to say, oh, hell. <laughs> and if you've ever experienced one of those situations, you haven't been on planet Earth long enough. <laughs> what? What? I worked my behind off for of seven years to get my wife and I get the girl with weak eyes? You know what's so funny? It's okay when you're tricking your father into giving you the blessing of the older one, but when you're the one getting tricked, it don't feel so good. <laughs> you caught that, didn't you? Oh my God! Laban! What is happening here? He said, what? What happened? I said, you give me the wrong target. Now, I understand we can laugh, and, and it is kind of funny, but can you imagine what it felt like to be this girl? Completely out of her, like she did not choose to do this. This was not her plan. She was placed there. It was not her choosing. Can you imagine the anguish in the heart to know that early in the morning, this man who has been intimate with you all night suddenly looks at you and is horrified by your presence? Huh. And you're left half naked, in a tent, weeping. This is not your fault, but there's nothing you can do to change what just took place. It is not your plan. And there you're sitting, alone, trying to cover yourself, to have a little bit of dignity. And there's arguing and yelling and fighting next door, in another tent. And it's your husband that you didn't choose yelling at your father because he tricked him. What do you do? Where do you go? What do you do? Where do you go? And you over here, they make another deal. They said, all right, well, you know, it's our custom. We have to marry off the first daughter. But if you still want Rachel, here's what we're going to do. You can work for another seven years. And you can have her too. So you're sitting there half naked trying to get some dignity and you're hearing all this taking place and you know this deal, this new deal sounds good for them but it doesn't sound good for you because you're still on the outs. You're not, you're, you're not received. This is not part of the plan. You're not part of the plan. You're like the third wheel that is not wanted nor is it invited nor is even desired to be there. Imagine that. And now suddenly you see your sister and your husband going off and enjoying themselves. And you're sitting there. 
unwanted, unloved, not beautiful. You've got to understand, for her to be the older sister and still unmarried, that means that there was something about her appearance that caused people not to be attracted to her. Otherwise, she would have gotten married already. So she was not wanted by even the people who knew her. She was not someone that you would look at and say, what a beautiful person, like to get to know this person a little bit more. She was unwanted and rejected. And now, her sister and her husband have a plan. They can continue being together, but you're all alone. And she wept. And she wept. Because there's nothing she could do about it. Oh, except for one thing. Her sister couldn't have children. Her womb was closed. And so this man who had no feelings for you whatsoever would come in the middle of the night to be intimate with you, not to enjoy intimacy, but to simply see if you can produce children because in that culture you needed to have children, you needed to have sons so that you could continue your legacy. So imagine being in that sorrow and every once in a while the tent opens up and this man comes in and says, lay down. And then he's intimate with you. And then when he's done, he just leaves. And he leaves you there to clean yourself. All alone. Rejected, abandoned, shamed. And suddenly, <laughs> she started having a feeling like she needed to have ice cream and pickles. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? So what's happening to me? And she realized. Something has happened inside of her. She has become pregnant. And she, for the first time, is excited. She's full of joy. She realizes, oh my God, oh my God, my husband doesn't love me, but I have a son to give him. Maybe, maybe he'll turn to me. Maybe he'll, 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 he'll be attracted to me because I'm giving him a gift, a tremendous gift. It's a firstborn son. So the boy is born, and she names him Reuben. Reuben means, behold, a son. And she brings the son to the husband and says, I have given you a son. His name is Reuben. Behold, the son. Jacob took the child and went over to hang out with his other wife, the sister, the loved one, handed the child over to her. And her joy goes from like a roller coaster, from a short moment of joy to, to even more grief and more sorrow. Alone, rejected, backstory. Time goes by, and suddenly that feeling comes again. She realizes she's with child yet again. And she's thinking to herself, surely, surely, the Lord has heard my cry. And she had a second son, and she called him Simeon. Simeon comes from the Hebrew word Shema. Listen, hear. She says, the Lord has heard my cry. Maybe my husband will hear my cry. And he will love me. There's the same thing. She realized she was just an object, a baby-making machine, rejected and abandoned, with no love. Yet again, she became pregnant. And she said, now this is the third one. Surely, my husband will attach himself to me this time. And she named the third son, Levi, which in Hebrew means to be attached or laced together. She had hope, certainly by the third son, that there's going to be a connection. I'll be able to connect with my husband. I'll be able to have him caress my hair. I'll be able to have him just hold me, bring me flowers, do something. Just acknowledge my presence other than to just impregnate me for no reason other than to just have sons. And you have to understand by the third child, in the Hebrew mindset, when something happens three times, it's established, it's set. 
Like you have the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He cannot be established with one generation. It's with three, three generations is established. We understand an expression of God as son, father, spirit. There's, there's these, this, <laughs> this way of understanding God that is more than just son, more than just spirit, more than just father. There's something that when something happens three times, it is established. It's like when, when, when Peter denies Messiah three times, it's established. It cannot be undone. It is set. It is set. It is set. When Leah saw that after the third son, there is nothing she could do to gain the love acceptance of her husband. She realized this was impossible. There is nothing she could do by giving him a son. There was nothing she could do by crying out to the Lord. There was nothing she could do by attaching herself to him by giving a third son. There was nothing she could do. It was established. It was clear. She gave up. She gave up trying. She no longer cared to try. And it is at the moment that she said, I give this desire up. It no longer matters to me. She said. And then she got pregnant. And she said, now I will praise the Lord. And she gave birth to Judah. Let me tell you something. In that place where there is rejection, in that place where there is suffering, in that place where there is absolutely no hope, at that moment you have to say, now it's time to praise the Lord. And when you do that, you establish the Messianic line. The line of Messiah could not be established as long as she was trying to get what she needed, what she even deserved, what she wanted. She could not obtain it by her own work. It had to be in the situation where she says, this is not in my hands. This is in the hands of my God. And now I will praise him. I want you to understand that in all these difficult moments of your life, when you feel rejected, when you feel there's no hope, when there's nothing, you have to find that now moment for you that it's time to praise the Lord. Not because of what He's going to do, not because of what you hope, not because of what you're trying to get, but simply because though He slay me, I will praise Him. The Messianic line is always Activated. Yeah. When you put your desires aside and say, now it's time to praise the Lord. Whatever happens doesn't matter. And from that moment on, she stopped trying to get the love of her husband. And amazingly, she stopped having babies as well. It was no longer important. I want you to understand that when Paul and Silas were in prison, they had been beaten, they had been spit at, they had been thrown in the depths of the prison, which is where they have like the, 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 the worst criminals. And that's where they were. There is no hope. There's no way out. You're probably going to die. This is probably the end of the road. And now for them, it was time to begin to sing and praise the Lord. And when they began to sing and praise the Lord, the whole place began to shake. And the doors could not stay closed. The whole prison was empty. Let me tell you something. When you find that now moment for you, there are people who are incarcerated around you who will be set free because you said it is no longer I that live, but Messiah who lives in me. I don't need anything. I am going to praise the Lord if this is the last thing I can do. <laughs> and the jail was crashed open. And the jailer was going to kill himself. And they said, no, don't do that. We're here. We're right here. Don't worry about that. And it says that the jailer and his whole entire house were saved. Why? Because the messianic reality is always established. Awakened. Birthed. When you stop trying to get what is rightfully yours. And you say, it doesn't matter anymore. Now it's time. To praise the Lord. You have had these moments and you will have these moments if you have them. Father, help us to know the now moments. The now moments. Some of you have been praying for a situation for so long, for so long, for so long, and you're waiting for God to do something. I'm telling you, keep waiting. 
But there's a time where you're going to say, okay, you know what, waiting doesn't matter anymore. I'm, now I'm going to praise him. I don't care what he does. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and you choose to praise the things of the kingdom instead of praising the things that you really want, that you really desire, that you really hope for. That's when they throw three in the fire and you see a fourth one up here. Countless, countless moments in time where you can see. It's not what you've achieved. It's not how much you worked for. It's not what you deserve. It's when you say, now it's time. I praise the Lord. I don't care what happens after this. The messianic line is established. Let me tell you something else. When a messianic line is established, see, because that's where Judah comes from. See, Judah comes as a result of that. Yeah. Yeah. See, the Torah portion is focusing on Jacob. But amazingly, there's a back story Jacob doesn't even know. But Jacob has absolutely, no, believe me, has no idea what his weak, wide wife is praying and what's going on with her. He clearly has no clue that she's literally activating the messianic line. There is one greater than Jacob coming. And it's after that's activated that things begin to transform themselves for Jacob. Jacob is fighting here front to front, but there's something behind him taking place that has no control over. Because someone gave it all up and said, now it's time to praise the Lord. See, his name cannot be changed as long as someone is trying to change him. Now he becomes Israel. And isn't that amazing? When Israel was about to die, he had one request from his sons. He said, when I die, be sure to lay my body next to Leah in the grave. What an amazing thing. A man who spent all of his life <laughs> trying to work for the love of his life, that girl who was so hot and so shapely, when he became mature, he realized that even in death it would be better to be laid next to the one who said, now it's time to praise the Lord, I don't care what you do. <laughs> Father, we ask. We ask that you will not allow us to miss our now moment when it's time to praise you. We ask, Father God, that you'll take our eyes away from the things that we so, so long for, so, so hope, so, so need. So, so think that if I only had this, I would be okay. Father, help us to have weak eyes towards the things that we begin to praise you even though our form is not shapely. <laughs> Help us to know the now moment when it is time to praise you despite all things.